Good morning, man. Cross point. A little cool weather, a little extra sleep. Everybody shows up. This is great. Well, let's use what we got. Let's stand to our feet and worship him today. Stand up. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Crosspoint. My name is Kim, and we're so glad you're here with us this morning. If you're, it's your first time with us, I want to say welcome. I want to invite you to stop out at the Welcome Center after the service. There are some people out there, and they would love to meet you and say hello to you. They have a gift for you, and it's just our way of saying, saying thank you so much for being here. Also, uh, you can ask them about our next Connect Lunch. If you're newer to Crosspoint and have not been to a Connect Lunch yet, I want to personally invite you. It is next Sunday at 12.15 after second service, and you, it's a chance for us to get to know you better, you get to know more about us and meet others that are new here, and most importantly, it's our first step to get connected here at Crosspoint. So we hope you'll join us. You can register out at the Connection Point, out, out at the Welcome Center, we haven't had one of those in a long time, or on the Crosspoint Cape app. Also, if you're new with us online this morning, welcome. We're so glad you're here. I want to encourage you to jump in the chat, say hello, and click that new here button. It's a great way for us to get to know you as well. Hey, guys, it's going to be a great morning. Let's continue to worship. Connection point. I hope this is a connection point for every one of us this morning, that this moment, you know that there's, there's folks that have come in to this room and prayed over every single chair uh, this morning for each of us that would sit there, that we would have an, an encounter with God today. So as we sing, we're gonna sing a beautiful song about the goodness of God, who he is to us, how near he is to us, and just think what our response could be to return something back to him in worship this morning. Let's try to do that.
him to show up in your life this morning? Or do you need him to make a way for you? Ask him. Let's continue to worship. You are here moving in our Working in this place, amen. I worship you. I worship you. And you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, in the name.
more time at it. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Man, let's pray together, church. Father, we probably most of the time can't see exactly what you're doing. And a lot of the time it's true that we can't feel how you're working. But God, build our faith this morning. Cause us to trust that you are always at work for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, Crosspoint. It is uh, good to see you guys. My name is Jeff, and I do still work here. <laughs> Probably began to wonder these last couple of weeks, huh? Well, uh, Peg and I had a great time in Illinois. Uh, got to spend some time with our third grandchild, and so that was a great trip for us, and we're uh, just feeling very blessed these days. I'm going to give you a, a quick reminder. just want to keep this in front of you. Uh, we challenged you months ago now to kind of be watching in your neighborhood for new houses that were going up, houses that were for sale, praying for the people who would move into those homes, and then uh, taking them a gift. And these gifts continue to be available out in the lobby. There's a card and uh, some hand soap, and I uh, just want you to take that, knock on the door as they move in, welcome them to your neighborhood, and invite them to come and join us at Crosspoint. And so I want to see all those gifts eventually disappear because you've put them into the hands of people and offered those invitations. So I just want to encourage you to continue to do that. I hate it when I'm driving down the road and there's a big detour sign, right? And uh, it's not as bad now in the, the age of GPS, but most of us can remember when we didn't have that luxury and like you were stuck there, right? You didn't know it was coming, there's a detour, and so you got to make a choice. You got to go around it, right? Now, in my, uh, let's say, less immature or less mature days, if the road wasn't completely blocked off, I will confess to you that I would think sometimes, I wonder if it's really closed down. <laughs> I bet you I could get through there, right? And sometimes I would try before I really was following Jesus faithfully, right? <laughs> Anybody else confess this morning that you've done the same? Thank you. You're good people. And you're honest. Thank you. <laughs> And sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't. Sometimes there was a big hole in the road, and you had to turn around and come back out, right? You know what? I, road detours are not the only kind of detours that we run into. Cancellation, an interruption, a financial setback, a broken relationship, a sickness, a surprise announcement. And they all feel like detours because they take us off of our intended or preferred route. Suddenly we have to make changes. We have to adjust. And I don't know about you, but I don't like any of those kinds of detours because I want to stay on the path that I've chosen. And I don't want an unexpected interruption or change or have to make some kind of adjustments. And I, and I know, but here's the reality, right? Detours are a part of life. Like you can't get away from them. They're going to happen. And so here's the question. When a detour pops up in my life, do I continue to trust God? 
Or maybe we could ask it this way. When a detour pops up in my life, do I believe that God is big enough to guide me through the detour? Maybe the question we need to ask ourselves is how big is God in your life? Because how we see God, and I know this is true for me, and I'm guessing it's true for you, how I see God affects how I live my day. Right? Because if I have this sort of shrunken image of God, then I have a tendency to let anxiety and stress overwhelm me because I think everything depends on me. And if I have a shrunken image of God, then prayer doesn't seem natural because I'm not completely convinced that he's going to do anything. And if I have this shrunken image of God, then I am a slave to what other people say about me because I am not living in the security of his love. And if I have a, a shrunken image of God, I will worship without awe, I will serve without joy, and I will suffer without hope. And if I have a shrunken image of God, then I will have this tendency to be overwhelmed by every detour that pops up. You see, I'm pretty sure for many of us, there are times in our lives where we are not completely convinced that we are absolutely safe in the hands of an ever-present, all-knowing, utterly loving, infinitely big God. So what do we do when the detours pop up? Because they are. How do we have the faith to move forward when they pop up? Well, that's what I want to talk about for these next three weeks. I want to share with you some reminders because I want us to be fully convinced that if you have God, you've got all you need to move boldly forward. If God is with you, you have all you need to move boldly forward in faith. And to begin this journey, I want to start with a guy who suddenly has a big detour pop up in his life. His name is Gideon. And his story is one of my favorites in the Old Testament. Gideon's story begins, we find out about him, at a time when the Israelites are literally living in caves and clefts in the rock because the Midianites have sort of invaded their land and they're afraid. Now, this was a time when the Israelites would kind of turn their back on God, try to do their own thing, and they'd get farther and farther from God, and so God would allow the enemies to attack them. And this is one of those moments the Midianites would invade their land and ruin their crops and steal from them. And the Israelites are afraid. And that's where Gideon comes into the picture here. In fact, Judges, the book of Judges, chapter 6, is where we find out about Gideon. Here's what we, where we're going to pick the story up. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, stop here for a second. He is threshing wheat in a wine press, right? Normally, they would thresh wheat up on maybe the top of a hill on a flat surface where the wind could catch the grain and blow away what wasn't worth keeping and let the grain fall back down. But he's in a wine press, which was often at the bottom of a hill and had walls on the sides of it. He's hiding from the Midianites. This is not an effective way to thresh wheat. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, there's a part of me that wonders if there's a little sarcasm when this angel speaks here. You mighty warrior who's threshing weed in a wine press, you little scaredy cat. I don't know. That's just my interpretation. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now Gideon, it seems to me, is kind of minding his own business, doing life the way he is with the Midianites around, and suddenly this detour is going to pop up in his life. And there's no doubt that Gideon's living in fear, fear of the Midianites, fear of what might happen. And friends, I, I'm thinking that for most of us, when a detour pops up in our lives, fear and uncertainty are one of the first things that we often feel. Now, we handle that in different ways. For some of us, we're overwhelmed by anxiety and stress. For some, we just kind of shut down or withdraw. For others, we just try to run faster. We respond in different ways, but the root emotion is the same for all of us. It's that fear and uncertainty that comes because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's ahead. 
And I think Gideon at this point begins to fear, feel some of that. And listen to what happens next, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. God, I don't have the strength to do this. So notice what is said next. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Did you catch that? God doesn't say, Gideon, you move forward because you're big and strong, you're extra talented, you're super smart. No, he says, Gideon, you move forward because I am with you. And friends, if you don't take anything else home today, I want you to take this home with you. You can move forward with the same kind of confidence because God is with you too. And if God is with you, then you have all you need to move boldly forward. Maybe we need an image in our minds of how God is with us. Uh, There's a pastor, John Ortberg, who tells this story about uh, he and uh, some other church leaders he was with were walking along the beach in Newport Beach, California, and there was this bar along the beach, and a fight had broken out inside the bar and spilled out into the street, like just like a scene out of TV, right? He said there were these three guys, and they were just beating up this other guy, All right? And he was bloody, and so they thought like they had to do something, and so they hollered, hey, you guys, you stop that. And the three guys turned around and looked at him, and their eyes got as big as saucers, and they thought, wow, we must look pretty impressive. And then they realized they were looking right past them to a guy who was like 6'7", who'd walked out of the bar, weighed 300 pounds, about 2% body fat. I mean, he was just huge. And he was staring them down, and they took off running, and Ortberg and his friends hollered, and don't you come back again. (laughs) Suddenly they were emboldened with courage, not because of their own strength, but because of who was standing behind them. And maybe you and I, friends, need to realize that we are not emboldened when the detour comes up in our lives because of who we are, but because of who stands with us. And if God is with us, You have all you need to move boldly forward. Well, I think Gideon is feeling that, and so he begins to take some steps forward. The first thing he does is to offer an offering to God. He goes and he takes one of the rams in his herd, and he slays it, kills it, so that he can offer it as a sacrifice. And don't miss what he's doing here. This was an act of adoration and worship and obedience But it was also an act of generosity and maybe even some extravagance. Because you think about, especially as the Midianites were invading their land, their herd was their source of life and maybe income. And Gideon takes one of those of his herd that was worth some money and he sacrifices it as an offering to God. And then God says to him, I want you to do some things. I want you to take down all of the altars to Baal that you Israelites have been worshiping Baal from. I want you to tear down the Asherah pole that you've been bowing down to. And then I want you to rally your fellow citizens to go to war against the Midianites. And so Gideon does all of that. Tears down the altars, tears down the pole. He rallies his citizens to come, and then God says, I, now I want you to offer me another sacrifice. And again, out of adoration and obedience, he takes a bull from his herd, and he sacrifices that to God, an act of generosity and extravagance too. But so Gideon has moved forward, and now God is about to give him instructions about how to go into battle, but suddenly it seems like the fear comes back over Gideon again, and maybe you've been there. A detour pops up in your life, and you're, at first you're overwhelmed by fear, but then you begin to take some steps forward, and suddenly the fear comes rushing back in one more time. I think that's where we find Gideon, and so look at what he does next in verse 36. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, he's kind of asking, look, I, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all of the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. Right? And so God says, okay, we'll do that. 
And exactly what Gideon has asked for happens. But Gideon's not convinced enough the first time and says, says, God, let's do it tomorrow night. Let's just do it in reverse. So God does it. And Gideon is convinced that he can move forward. He needed to be reminded that God was still with him. And maybe you find yourself in that place even today where you've tried to take some steps forward, but the fear came rushing back in, and today you need to be reminded God is still with you. And maybe in the future, you'll try to walk forward, but the fear will come back. In those moments, just ask God, hey, God, would you do something? Maybe not, don't ask him to do as dramatic as wet or dry fleece, but just ask him, God, would you do something today that is a reminder to me that you are still with me? Because God is with you. You have everything you need to move boldly forward. And so God is ready to send Gideon into battle. He has accumulated this army. Historians and scholars say Gideon gathered about 32,000 men to go to battle with, but the Midianites had 135,000. But God says to Gideon, you know what? Your army is too big. Wouldn't you love to see the look on Gideon's face? What do you mean? (laughs) It's too big. God says, if you go into battle with that big of an army, you're going to take all the credit. And you won't give me the glory. So look at what God tells him to do, Judges chapter 7. Now, announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. Again, I'd like to see the look on Gideon's face as 22,000 men went home. All right, God continues. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. And here was the way God said to separate the two. God said, take them down to the river, and the ones who take water into their hands and lap it like a dog, you keep them. The guys who drink by getting down on their knees in other ways, send them home. Which, just by the way, notice that he tells them to keep the ones that were like a dog, And cats are never mentioned here. (laughs) Just saying. So now Gideon is left with 300 men, right? And Gideon has to be thinking, God, the odds were against us when we had 32,000. But now you want me to take 300 men into battle against 135,000 armed soldiers? God, this has got to be some kind of mistake. God, what are you thinking? I don't understand how this plan can possibly work. And maybe you've been there. See, one of the lessons we need to recognize in our lives is that detours look like a mistake before they become a miracle. Detours look like a mistake before they become a miracle. I've seen this in my own life. It was just a short time into planting Crosspoint when we learned that our oldest son, Michael, had cancer and would require a long series of treatment. And more than once, I said to God, this has got to be a mistake. God, I don't see how this could be your plan. God, don't you see everything that we gave up to plant a church for you? Don't you see what we're trying to do for your kingdom? How can this be part of the plan? God, this must be some kind of mistake. But often it looks like a mistake before it becomes a miracle. That's going to be true for Gideon. And maybe you have your own stories about times where God did something and it seemed like a mistake, but ultimately you could see the victory that he was able to win for you. It's hard, isn't it? For Gideon, though, the miracle is coming. And we can see, I can tell you this morning, the the miracles came in our lives, but they were down the road. Michael today is healthy, serving in ministry, loves God, loves his church. Obviously, someone who's going through all the chemo that he had, we wondered if he'd ever be able to give birth to a child. And yet, we held that miracle in our arms last weekend. The miracle comes. And the miracle's coming for Gideon. In fact, God says to him, listen, I I, I want you to have some more confidence. So he sends him over by the Midianite camp to hear, over here, a conversation two Midianites are having. And the one is saying, hey, I had this dream that Gideon's soldiers are going to kill us all, defeat us. 
And so Gideon feels confidence, and he goes back and hands out the strangest weapons you've ever heard of for battle, a torch, a pitcher, and some trumpets. And he takes his men, and he lines them up on three sides of the camps of the Midianites, and here's what the Scripture says happens. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding the right, in their right hands the trumpets as they were to blow. And they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. And what seemed like a mistake became a miracle. God gave Gideon and his 300 soldiers an overwhelming and total victory on that day. Now listen, I don't know if it'll always be that dramatic in our lives, but I do know this and believe it with all of my heart. If we will recognize that God is with us and that that's all we need to move boldly forward and we will walk forward with him, ultimately he will give us the victory. That does not mean that all the detours will disappear. It doesn't mean that navigating through them will be easy. It doesn't mean that we will always understand God's way. Sometimes he will ask us to do things that don't make sense. But if we'll trust him, and if we'll recognize that if God is with us, we can move boldly forward, he will ultimately give us the victory. Now, at the beginning of the year, we announced a leadership transition here at Crosspoint. And maybe when you first heard that news, it seemed like a pretty big detour. Probably responded with a lot of different emotions. In fact, maybe there were some who thought that seems like a mistake. But I know this to be absolutely true with all of my heart. That as a church, we will be fine. If God is with us, we can, we have all we need to move boldly forward into the future. So let me give you just a quick update on where we are in this transition. And then there's two more things I want to point out in this story that I want to challenge us to do. We are still in the process of searching for the right person to come and be the new director of student ministry here at Cross Point. It has taken us longer than we would have expected, but we are determined not to compromise. We want to find exactly the right person. We value our student ministry so much that we are determined to follow, find the person that God makes clear to us and gives us total peace about. And so we are continuing that process and searching. Once we find that person, then Matt is going to take whatever time is necessary Again, to make a really smooth handoff to that person because we want student ministry to continue to thrive in the same way that it does now. And then we are committed to months of time after that for me to make a smooth handoff to Matt. And so this transition will not happen until well in to 2022. But as we think about moving towards that, I want us to do it with faith that God is with us. And there are two things that I think Gideon does in this story that helped him to know that God was with him. And I want to challenge us to do these same two things. In fact, I want to challenge every person who considers Crosspoint their church to do these two things. Listen to what Gideon did first. The Midianites. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Right? So the first thing they did is they, they cried out to God for help. They prayed. And so as we move into this new year when the transition will happen, I want to challenge us to pray in a couple of ways. First, I want to do something. I want to bring back something that was pretty prevalent around here during the time that we were anticipating the building of this facility that we're in this morning. I want to invite you to, you can do this right now if you want, take out your phone and set an alarm for every day at 204. 204 is our address. There's nothing more spiritual about it than that. But would you set that alarm at 204, and every day when that goes off for just a few seconds, would you at least stop and pray and ask God to show that he is with us and to move us boldly into the future? There's just something that happens, right, to know that, man, at that same time every day, all of us are are stopping, even if it's just for a second, even if it's just mentally while I'm in a meeting, to pray and ask God to guide us into the future. The second part of this first thing that I want to invite us to do as a church is to fast, Right? And so between now and the end of this year, December 31st, I want to challenge you to consider fasting one meal a week or one day a week. That's just eight weeks, so eight meals or eight days. Would you fast, and together during that time, let's ask God to move us boldly into the future. 
And there's some, what, do, what do I do when I fast? Well, the time that you would have spent eating, spend that time praying and asking God. What do I pray about? Let me give you a few things. Pray for our student ministry search that we'll find exactly the right person. Pray for Matt, that God will fill him with everything he needs to step boldly into this position and to lead our church into a very, very exciting future. Pray for our staff, right? The transition absolutely affects them. And so would you pray that they would continue to have peace about the future? Pray for our shepherds, that as they shepherd our flock and lead us, that they'd have be, continue to be filled with wisdom. Would you pray for protection? I believe Satan is on the attack. I believe he knows our greatest days are ahead, and he wants to stop that. I feel like we've been attacked more as a church in the last year than any time in our history. And so would you pray for God to protect us, to put a wall of protection around us? And then would you pray that we would continue to reach hundreds and hundreds of people in our city who are living far from God? I'm hoping that what happened at Trunk or Treat just a week ago was just a glimpse of the kinds of things that God wants to do to help us to reach people across our city. So would you pray about those things? Then here's the second thing that Gideon did. They built, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bowl as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. Gideon made those sacrifices to God. He gave God an offering. It was an act of worship and adoration, but it was also something about it that was generous and maybe even extravagant. So here's what I want to ask you to do, the second thing. Between now and the end of the year, would you consider giving a generous, maybe even extravagant gift over and above your regular giving to help us move boldly into the future? On our giving platform, later this week, when you go to the funds, you'll be able to pull down and select forward, or you can write that on the memo of your check. All of the money that's given through this forward initiative over the next few weeks will go to help us pay down the principal on our loan that we have for this building. And here's why I want us to do this. If we could raise $100,000 between now and the end of the year, and that is not a big amount for God, we would be able to pay down that principal and we would be able to reach a plateau in our uh, loan agreement that would drastically drop our interest rate and save Crosspoint literally thousands and thousands of dollars and free up space in our budget. This is really important to me. I want to leave Crosspoint in the very best financial situation that I possibly can. So I want to ask you to pray about that and to think about what could you do to give generously, maybe even extravagantly, between now and the end of the year. Listen, I, have, I am so excited about the future. I believe our greatest days, our greatest chapters in our story are ahead of us. And I have that confidence because I know that God is with us. And if God is with us, then we have everything we need to move boldly forward into the future. I also know this to be true. In all of our individual lives, detours are gonna continue to pop up, aren't they? Some of you will have one this week. It'll come unexpectedly. When it does, would you remember what we've talked about this morning, that God is with you. And if he is, you have everything you need in that moment to move boldly forward, trusting and walking with God to guide you through that detour. Would you pray with me? God, we want to trust you. We thank you that you are with us. And God, we pray that uh, as we think about our lives and the detours that maybe we've experienced this past week or the ones that will come in the days ahead, that you would just keep reminding us that you are always with us. And God, that we can trust you to walk on through those detours because you are with us. And God, as a church, we want to move boldly forward into the future. Would you help us to remind us that you are with us? God, as we seek you in prayer and fasting over the coming days, as we contemplate giving an offering to you, God, would you use those things to work in our hearts to say, I am with you, you can trust me, and help us to move boldly forward into the future. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and continue to worship with us? Hello. 
seated. On the night that Jesus was going to be crucified, he told Peter that later Peter was going to deny him 
three times. And Peter protested at this, right? His response was like, you're crazy. There's no way. Like, I'm so fully devoted to you. I am all in. There, like, there's zero chance of me denying you, of turning against you. I would die for you, Jesus. And then he does it three times. As Jesus has been arrested, Peter denies knowing him denies being one of his followers, even calls down curses on himself if he's lying, that he he would never, he would never, never know Jesus. And then he he realizes what he's done. And the the Bible tells us that, that he runs away and weeps bitterly. He's destroyed by this decision that he's made, by the the mistake that he's made to deny Jesus. And I I wonder if it felt like it was over for him. He's obviously destroyed by this, right? It's not just that he's like, oh man, I messed up again. He weeps bitterly at this mistake. And then he waits. He waits. And he wonders, is it over? Do I serve a purpose anymore? Am I going to be part of this thing that Jesus had planned? Or or is the thing that Jesus had planned, is that over now? And he lives with this guilt. Later, after Jesus rises from the grave, he has a conversation with Peter and invites him back. He he, he offers him this opportunity to come and be a part of, of what Jesus wants to do, again, invites him to to feed his sheep, to care for the people that Jesus loves. And guys, in that time where Peter was destroyed, where he is, is waiting and wondering, consumed by guilt, I think that some of us sit there. We sin and, and we just, we sit in our guilt. And we, we skip over the truth that, that we don't have to live in that. We serve a savior who died on a cross, who poured out his blood so that our sins could be forgiven and and we don't have to walk in that guilt anymore. We don't have to be consumed by our shame. Our sins are forgiven. And we can go back to our savior and we can repent and we can walk with him again. And so this morning, as we share in a time of communion, I I want to invite you to just take a moment. Maybe you have something that that you have held on to, a a sin in your life that that you've refused to hand over to Jesus to to allow him to forgive you for. I want to invite you to take a moment and thank him for the price that he paid so that we don't have to, to wonder. We don't have to wonder if Jesus can still use us. So you can take that that bread, which represents his body, and the juice, which represents his blood. And I'll come back in a moment to pray and wrap things up. for what you, what you did on the cross. That God, you, you, you took on our sins. You took on our mistakes. You took on our decisions where we turned our back on you, where we denied you. We are, are so, so grateful that, that we don't have to carry that guilt and that shame, but that we are forgiven. We get to walk with you again. We get to be part of what you want to do in this world. We love you and we are so grateful for this gift. In Jesus' name, amen. 
This is a time in our service where we have the opportunity to give our tithes and our offerings. And if you're a guest with us today, we don't want you to feel any pressure or obligation to give. Uh, this is a way that we worship and um, something that, that we do to, to honor God. And so we're, we're going to do this, but I, I do want to celebrate with you guys. Uh, man, as we give, the, there's, there's some really incredible things that happen in, in our community all around the world, but, but also right here at Crosspoint. As we give, that, that's, that's what some of the money goes towards is, is fueling our ministry here in this church. And, and I want to celebrate with you guys the impact that, that happens in Kid Point as we uh, all give. And as so many of you in this room uh, serve in our Kid Point ministry, I, I can't even tell you guys how grateful I am uh, now as a parent. Uh, because I spent years and years, I served in kids ministry, I was on staff here and, and worked with Crystal closely and, and just kind of was in awe of how great of a job the Kid Point do, team does at, at serving our families, at laying an incredible foundation of faith for our kids. And I was like, man, that's really cool, but it was kind of over there even as I served in it. But all of a sudden I, I have kids over these last couple years and I'm like looking at it, I'm like, man, this is awesome that every Sunday my, my kids get to go and be part of a ministry where the people there don't just, they don't just want to watch them for an hour. They don't just want to keep them entertained so that I can come in here and worship. They, they want to help to lay a solid ministry foundation for my kids, for them to, to have a foundation of understanding who God is and how he loves them. And, and it's because of your giving that, that that ministry exists. And so I just want to say thank you. Thank you for partnering with us in this. And I just want to take a moment and pray for Kid Point and for, for all of our ministry here at Cross Point. God, I, I thank you for Kid Point. I thank you for the way that you work through some incredible volunteers, through, through our staff, our, our Kid Point team. God, we, we are, are so, so grateful for the work that you are doing in the hearts of our children. God, we, we're, we're so thankful for the way that you are equipping them, the way that you are, are laying a foundation for their future, and for their relationship with you, God. We, we pray that, that you will continue to work in that section, God, of our building, that, that you will continue to work through these volunteers, God, that, that you will continue to change hearts in our Kid Point ministry. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you, Matt. Well, the holidays are approaching quickly. Uh, rumor has it that some of you might even have your Christmas trees up already. Anybody? Hmm? Couple? Okay, that's cool. Um, as you're making your plans, we want to make sure that you put Christmas Eve at Cross Point in your plans. We have four services on December 23rd and 24th at 5 and 6.30. They're all identical services. Um, we'll have a lot more details coming out about those later, but we wanted to get those dates to you right away and let you start thinking about who you're gonna be inviting and which service you're gonna attend at Cross Point on Christmas Eve. If there's anything going on in your life and you can use somebody to pray for you this morning, our prayer team is going to be available right here in the front of the service after the service and they would love to pray with you or more importantly talk to you about your relationship with Jesus. If you're online this morning and you could use some prayer, we have a team available. Just click that request prayer button and they would love to spend some time praying with you this morning. Guys, it's going to be a great week. Go out and love God, love people, and share Jesus. We'll see you next Sunday.